Costello, the Programming Director for South by Southwest EDU, and on behalf of our entire team, uh, I can't emphasize enough how glad we are uh, that you're able to join us here this evening. As some of you may know, we plan to host our inaugural International Women's Day program at South by Southwest CDU 2020 here at Antones as well. And while that uh, program didn't come to pass, um, I really can't say how glad we are that we're finally able to gather together at such a wonderful uh, and historic venue like Antones here in Austin. This evening's program highlights incredible individuals and organizations who are doing the important work of ensuring an equal and inclusive world for all, free of bias, stereotypes, and discrimination. We'll hear from the Special Olympics, Teach for America, Momentum, and Rosa Rebellion on their visions and initiatives. And before starting this evening's program, I'd like to take a moment to recognize someone we lost this year who is deeply woven into the fabric of South by Southwest. Rosanna Auden, the wife of co-founder and CEO of South by Southwest, Roland Swenson, left us far too early. To provide brief remarks on this day in which we celebrate the strength and wisdom of women everywhere, I'm pleased to introduce Tracy Mann, a longtime staff member at South by Southwest and a good friend of Rosanna's. Thank you so much, Julia. Oh, I'm so happy to be here with you this evening, and I feel so honored to say a few words about Rosanna. I hope I can do her justice and bring a sense of her really fierce intellect, her artist's ability with color and design, and the kind of friendship, the kind of friend, folks, that you want on your side in a fight. That's who Rosanna was. As I was doing a little research uh, to see what I wanted to tell you about her tonight, I, read, I went back and read columns that she had written for the Austin Chronicle in the 1990s. And I was not surprised to see that Rosanna hit every issue on the head that you'll be discussing here this week. Issues of LGBTQ uh, education in the schools, uh, the fallacious debate between parents' rights and uh, school curriculum indoctrination, even issues of real estate, de of, of school expansion that masked uh, uh, some suspect real estate development. And I would recommend uh, if you uh, read the Ross, uh, if you know the Austin Chronicle, take a look at some of Rosanna's bylines and you'd just be amazed that, you know, almost 30 years ago these, these topics were as fresh and her voice is so on point, is so take no prisoners just as, as Rosanna was. Um, like many of the women in the room, I'm sure you're going to relate to this, Rosanna was a woman you could not put into a box. You couldn't say she was a fabulous seamstress, which she was. You couldn't say she was a smart writer, which is, um, as I've told you, she, she clearly was. Um, and you couldn't say that she was uh, only a, a fabulous cook who made meals that everybody wanted a place at the table for, and, only, and, 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 and a very welcoming table at that, except for people who, whose foolishness she just was not going to tolerate, you know? So um, I think what I'd like to say in closing, um, I'll just say that uh, knowing Rosanna for almost 20 years, most of that time she had cancer. But cancer was not what defined who she was. She was really a marvelous friend, woman, powerhouse. And I believe that she kept up the good fight from her original diagnosis of cancer in 2006 until this past year because of her daughter, Christiane. And Christiane is now a young woman of 22 with her own remarkable, original, uncategorizable life. I'm sure her mom would be very proud. And I would also just add in closing that we often speak of Rosanna as the wife of the founder, our founder, Roland Swenson. And I can assure you, we would not be standing here, I would not be standing here, and we would not all be here together tonight for this marvelous edition of South by Southwest EDU if it were not for the partnership of two people in a really remarkable marriage of 30 years. So I hope you enjoy, feel inspired by this woman that probably most of you don't know, but leaves us with this hope and fight and grit and enjoy the evening. Thank you. And I'll pull it back to Julia. Thank you so much, Tracy, for that beautiful tribute. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our first talk from an amazing group of student athletes and partners from the Special Olympics. Build a, building upon and celebrating the work of Special Olympics founder Unitas Kennedy Shriver, the unified generation is now defining what equity in education means. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to our Special Olympics student leaders from Hendrickson High School.
right, now that I have the mic off. <laughs> um, good evening, my name is Kennedy Hushka and I am a senior at Hendrickson High School in Pflugerville, Texas. I am honored to be speaking with you all on this International Women's Day and especially on the topic of Eunice Kennedy Shriver's vision and the next generation. These wonderful women with me today are junior Melky Suresh, senior Elena Chacon, and freshman Dea Barnes. They will be speaking later this evening. We would like to thank South by Southwest EDU for having us and giving us the opportunity to share with you our message. Additionally, we want to thank Special Olympics North America, specifically Leah Bannon, for this opportunity to share what it means to be inclusive. I'm fairly certain that I was destined to be involved in Special Olympics. My name alone is Kennedy. <laughs> specifically named after the founder of Special Olympics, Eunice Kennedy Shriver. I was fortunate to grow up around Special Olympics, literally from birth. My mother has been a volunteer coach for Special Olympics for the last 30 years. I grew up in gyms, bowling alleys, softball fields, and track stadiums. Because of this, I never saw a difference. I saw people with varying abilities working together to achieve their goals, and families, coaches, and unified partners encouraging athletes to do their best. Seeing people come together in commonality is what inspired me to become a volunteer coach and unified partner for Special Olympics. Being partnered with another athlete competing in sports like bowling and soccer felt like getting a teammate and a friend at the same time. Elena and I both compete in unified bowling and always have fun doing it. Elena, what Special Olympic sports do you compete in? Mug. Track. Bowling. Bowling. Mug. And golf. 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 <laughs> Good job. Do you have fun while competing with your friends? Yes. I am so grateful for my experiences as a unified partner because it has led to me it led me to where I am today. In June, I will be traveling to Orlando, Florida, representing Team Texas in unified soccer at the Special Olympics USA Games. There I will play against talented unified soccer teams from all over the nation and be able to spread the idea of inclusion. So what does inclusion mean to me? By definition, inclusion has many meanings. This one most, the one most important to me is the act or practice of including and accommodating people who have historically been excluded because of their abilities. But inclusion is more than having people with intellectual disabilities on the playing field. It's about making a connection. It's making that person feel as though they are truly part of a team or a class or a job. It's not done out of sympathy or pity, but a willingness to include those with intellectual disabilities in our everyday lives and treat them as equals. Therefore, we created Unified Champion Ambassadors at Hendrickson. Special Olympics uses the terms athlete and partner. However, our principal, Mr. Daniel Garcia, felt the term ambassador more accurately described our student body to include all clubs on campus, not just sports. I have had the honor to have been president of UCS the last two years. The Special Olympics Unified Champion Schools program is aimed at promoting social inclusion by implementing inclusive sports, inclusive youth leadership opportunities, and whole school engagement by pulling ambassadors from every sport and club at Hendrickson. Elena, what group are you an ambassador for? Um, oh. <laughs> You. Cheer! <laughs> what do you love to say at our football games? Go Hawks! <laughs> do you love being an ambassador for UCS? Uh, yes! <laughs> I love being one too, Elena. Two years ago, almost to the day, Hendrickson High School was named one of the five schools in the nation to receive national banner recognition for our UCS campus program by ESPN, the only school in Texas that year to do so. 
What was even more special was that ESPN was on campus to help recognize this amazing accomplishment and those individuals that truly made it possible. The atmosphere in our gym that day was simply incredible. Elena proudly sang her favorite song. What's your favorite song, Elena? <laughs> the national anthem, that's right. You got to sing that in front of the entire school, the ESPN crew, and our jam-packed gym. The most important thing to note was that everyone in that gym had been positively affected by Unified Champions. Our banner hangs proudly in the gym and is not only a symbol of our accomplishments, but to remind us to continue our efforts throughout the years to come. I think if Mrs. Shriver was here today, she would be in awe of the accomplishments of our student body and their engagement with our intellectually disabled population. That we have found positive and encouraging ways of continuing her message of inclusion and hope that pre presenting here today, you will help her carry out her vision as well. I would be remiss if I did not recognize our amazing sponsors at Hendrickson. Ms. Amy Wiesenhutter, Mrs. Maggie Stecker, and our principal, Mr. Daniel Garcia. Also with us tonight is Ms. Claire Rebau, Program Director of Special Olympics Texas. Without these supportive staff, this program would have never been the success that it is. Can we please give them a round of applause? So what have we done? Here to answer this question is Melky Suresh. Thank you, Kennedy and Elena. Hello. My name is Melky Suresh. Inclusion to me means bringing everyone together regardless of their disabilities. Right, Dea? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> we have created a unified Champions Club to spread inclusion and create change among the school community. Joining UCS changed me as it opened my eyes to the unfairness and discrimination given to my classmates for having an intellectual disability. Witnessing how others were treated made me want to create an atmosphere that included all. During my freshman year, while walking the halls with a classmate, I was told that I should move to the other side as a student with disabilities was walking by. That struck me as odd as I didn't understand the reasoning to do so. After Unified Champions, it changed the culture of our campus so that students from all walks of life could walk the halls as one. It also changed the climate of our student body by creating bonds and friendships. Further, there have been more opportunities created for our intellectually disabled population, like creating a unified generation. Our UCS meetings are led by our general education officers, which is made up of all women, perfect for today's acknowledgement of International Women's Day. <laughs> Forty percent of our officers are intellectually disabled students, which has given them the opportunity to be student leaders on our campus. Want to know how it works? Let me give you some examples of our program. We hold bi-monthly ambassador meetings with student representation from all clubs and groups on campus. Each ambassador reports on upcoming events and shows how UCS can partner with their events and give us the opportunity to participate. Various examples of our ambassador relationships include sports nights, which are comprised of creating goodie bags, making posters, participating in team introductions, and attending games to cheer on our fellow Hawks. Art club, which has invited us to the district-wide chalk walk. Each year, ambassadors design and create one of the payment squares with the theme of promoting inclusion. Our relationship with the theater club and school dance team has also grown. UCS ambassadors participate in the annual Mr. HHS talent show and perform with their silver dancers at pep rallies. Unified Sports is also widely supported by our ambassadors to include golf, bowling, soccer, and cheerleading. <laughs> Dea, what sports do you play? Bowling. Bowling. Basketball. Basketball. Yeah. Track, that's right. Yeah. And what do you say when you win? Yeah. Buzzing gun. <laughs> Unified Champions has brought our community together. 
We have a yearly flag football competition between our local police department and our district special Olympics team, the Pflugerville Falcons. When choosing a motto for our program, one of our special education ambassadors came up with the term, I say yes. It means saying yes to inclusion in all opportunities. Our principal has always said yes to our inclusive ideas. If you are a principal, I encourage you to say yes. As we come to a close this evening, it's tradition for Hawks UCS to close our meetings with an I say yes chant, which Dea and Elena will lead us in today. On the count of three. One, two, three. Ah! Thank you. All right, let's hear it one more time for our student leaders. All right, well now we turn to another group of absolute rock stars from our community, educators themselves. It is my pleasure to introduce Elisa Villanueva Beard, the Chief Executive Officer of Teach for America. Drawing from her personal leadership journey, as well as lessons from a network of educators and advocates, Elisa will offer a vision for elevating and modernizing the teaching profession and ensuring a diverse educator workforce to best serve all students. Please welcome Elisa Villanueva Beard. Good evening. Thank you, Julia, for that introduction, and hello to all of you. As a woman of color leading one of the largest nonprofits in America, you better believe that I have been celebrating every minute of this day. And to honor the day, I want to tell you a story about a woman named Eva. Eva was born 72 years ago in a northeastern town in Mexico. The town she was born in is called Burgos. In this town, she lived in a two-room home. One room was dedicated for her, was reserved for her mom and dad. The other room was reserved for Eva and her six sisters that they shared together. Now, this home did not have running water or heat. And so every day, Eva and her sisters would have to go fetch water from a nearby well so that the family had what they needed. And in the evenings, their father would build fires in a tub. And when it was cold, they would bring it inside to keep everybody comfortable. Now the family had enough to eat, but they all had to do their part in order to keep it that way. So Eva and her sisters would assist their mother to make food homemade tortillas and cheese. And Eva actually helped her father prepare the fields to plant corn and melons. Um, and they had plenty. Now, some might think about this story, or hear this and think, wow, um, that must have been a hard life. But Eva saw it differently. They had a roof over their heads. They had enough to eat. They had each other. They had their faith. Eva's life was abundant. So at the age of 14, things changed. Right before she was going into high school, her family moved north to a town called Rio Bravo, Mexico. It's about 20 miles from the Texas-Mexico border. And, it was, and, and if you look at Rio Bravo and consider Burgos, it was like a metropolis for my mom. 
But it was there that she decided that she would no longer go to school, and instead she would help her family, so she got a job at a shoe store and later a restaurant. And so, at 17 years old, her life changed yet again. Eva traveled further north, this time to a town called Kingsville, Texas. It is a historic wild horse desert. It, it, there is a area that spans northern Mexico to south Texas, and it is where massive herds of wild mustangs used to roam. That's what it's known for. Eva's tío, tía, and prima encouraged her to join them in Mexico, I mean in the United States, and so my mom meant she had to leave her family and chart her new course, and that's what she did. When she got to Kingsville, she found a job at the little flower shop. It was there that she earned 65 cents an hour, and she did manage to save money. Um, after a few years of her Texas life, my mother turned her, I mean, Eva turned her attention to, uh, <laughs> darn it, Eva turned her attention to um, love and marriage. But Eva had a particular criteria for this topic. Any husband of Edvas would not need a car, not a house, not even a handsome face, though that was a bonus. The husband would need a college degree. My mom, Eva, knew that if she married a man with a college degree, her kids' lives would be different. And so, at 23 years old, she went on a blind date. Eva, oops. Eva met a man named Ramiro, whose family is also from Mexico. And the details of that date are lost to memory and history. But what Ramiro did have was he was on a path to earn his college degree. He was a firefighter by night to pay for his education. And not until he completed his college degree did Eva marry him. And almost 50 years later, they are still married. Now, Eva's journey is quite an inspiration to me um, because it demonstrates the resiliency of immigrants, the unlimited strength of women. And I have been so moved by her story and, and shaped by her because Eva Villanueva is in fact my mother. So my parents, um, Eva and Ramiro, who are my heroes in this lifetime, they were eventually made their way to McAllen, Texas, which is in the heart of the Rio Grande Valley. And it is there that she, they raised myself and my three siblings. And in our home, it was clear there were three priorities, our faith, our commitment to our family, and education. Even though my mom only had an eighth grade education, she knew that prioritizing that was the most important thing for her kids. So because of my mother, I am that kid that did absolutely everything right. I was an A-plus student, I was student body president, I was even an all-star basketball player, and yes, I do still have a mean jump shot, in case you were wondering. And so when it came time to start thinking about college, my parents really expected me to stay near home. That was sort of the tradition. And I somehow convinced them that heading north to DePaul University in Greencastle, Indiana, really? <laughs> Go Tigers! <laughs> um, headed north to, to Greencastle, Indiana, was best for me. And I think much like my mom charted her own course at the age of 17, I somehow knew it was my turn to chart my own course. So when I got to DePauw, it was um, culturally a shocking experience. <laughs> and it is when I met middle-class white America. I was sure that this would be the hardest part of my college experience. Um, and in fact, I, that ended up being really interesting to me. And I will admit, there were many times where I found myself in conversations or observing an, interact in, an interaction and thinking, what in the world am I doing here? Um, many times. But I actually realized I got lots of energy um, navigating that new world and learning from people who were so different than me. And then classes started. 
and I quickly came to realize that I was underprepared for the rigors of college. Now, this is a shocking experience because as you might recall, I did everything right. I just wasn't ready. I was that kid that was getting up at five in the morning to study. And I was studying for C's and D's. I called my mom a few months into this and I said, mom, I don't think I'm gonna make it. I'm literally doing everything I know how to do and I don't think I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna make it. And so mom, mom did, she did say, I, f I feel badly for you that it's so hard. And then very quickly pivoted and in no uncertain terms said to me, you are not welcome home until you receive your degree from DePaul University. And my dad backed her up. Now at the time, I, like, I still viscerally feel that because it was so mean, I thought. And so um, it was so painful to hear that because I felt so alone. But you know what? My parents' wisdom came into play because A, they knew I could do it. And B, they knew this was a defining moment for my life if I quit or if I stayed. So the mandate was clear. I hunkered down, I kept at it. I learned how to ask for help early on in my life at the age of 18, I got the help. I worked really hard and those C's and D's started to turn to C's and B's. And by my sophomore year, I was thriving. Of course I could do it. Of course I could hang and I did just that. But in my newfound success, I started to reflect on this and then I got really angry. I did, I felt lied to. Imagine, a high school kid does everything right. How is it possible? I almost quit. What would my life have been like if I quit? That was profound for me. And yes, I figured it out. I learned how to play the game but millions of children do not, and that is not fair. So I was gonna be a lawyer, that was my track. And then I met Teach for America my sophomore year in college, and it swept me off my feet, the mission and the people. I remember observing this group of people who quite literally would tear down walls for kids, who just rejected that this was okay and were committed to creating a different reality. And I remember thinking, I wanna be part of that team. Teach for America did not just exceed my expectations, it changed my life. I was so proud to join the 1998 core where I taught first and second grade bilingual education. And I stick with this because of them. Because I learned so much from my kids, their endless, boundless potential, and I'm committed to them. And I stay at Teach for America because of the exceptional leaders I get to work alongside in our core members, our alumni, and our staff. Now my mother's wisdom continues to reveal itself 23 years into this. People travel across seas and borders and even walls to come here to get access to the opportunities that this country affords us. My mother deeply valued the American education system. She knew that if her kids got a good education, they would have options in life. But in our country, we, we don't seem to act on that. We continue to do things that do not work for kids. My mom rejected that some conditions were just the way it was. Every teacher and principal knew my mother. My mom made it clear what her expectations were of teachers and her own kids academically, but also in the conditions created for learning. She expected to have things were respectful and caring in the classroom. And my mom's not alone. There are so many families who have the same commitment and it seems to me that the families that understand the most the life-changing power of education are those who are least served by the current system. Now my mom obviously understood the power of a teacher 
and education. And she was heartbroken when I told her I was gonna teach out of college. <laughs> when I told her I was not gonna go to law school, I was gonna teach. But you know what? When you step back and you reflect on, that was 23 years ago, and you look at our education system today and the profession of teacher, you cannot blame my mom for that reaction. What is true is that teaching is one of the greatest acts of leadership that anybody can choose to do. It is a privilege and an honor. But we don't treat it that way. We just continue to do things without questioning it. We, we are okay with the fact that teachers are not paid fairly. We accept that educators have to teach feed and support their students without adequate resources. We accept that some students will thrive, excel, they'll do great, and many students will fail. They will fall through the cracks. And the worst part is they're falling through the cracks not because they're less smart or less hardworking, they quite literally do not have the access or the opportunities that their peers do that do have the access and opportunities. That is what is holding us back. Now, when we step back and we look at all this, I think about how this pandemic has illuminated so much. Millions of Americans for the very first time has had that access to the massiveness, the enormity of the mandate of a teacher and the challenges that come associated with that. There is no better case for change of our education system than what we have lived through for the last two years. Here we go. So with that in mind, we, I have started to ask myself, what if we started over? What if we reconsidered, what is the purpose of education in 2022? What if every American treated the education system like my mother did? What would that mean for, this, for students? Not some students, all students. What would it mean for teachers? We can and we must reinvent our education system so that education is relevant, it's inspiring for our kids, where kids have access and opportunity to learn, lead, and thrive, all kids. It means we do have to move past the one-size-fits-all model. It means we have to center the student. It means we have to support the teachers. It means we have to have the highest of expectations for children and for the adults. It means we have to build on the incredible wisdom of the cultures that our children are bringing into the classroom. It means we have to have a teaching force that reflects the diversity of our teachers, of our students, excuse me. We have to ensure that our teachers are valued we have to reconsider the compensation system. We have to reconsider what is the role of a teacher. Our teachers have to feel like they are changing the world because they in fact are. There are no easy solutions and there are no singular solutions either, but we must stick with it. Because when we do stick with it, the next generation of mothers are going to beam with pride when their child says to them, mom, I'm gonna be a teacher. Because that mom is gonna know that their child is leading the way in this country. And so today on International Women's Day, I honor my mother, I honor all the women and all the educators who inspire us to be our best every single day. Thank you and happy International Women's Day. Thank you so much, Elisa. As we continue to explore the importance of diversity and inclusivity, 
we now look at the important work. Bye. Bye. Thank you. We now look at the important work that Admentum's We Can Learn Foundation is doing to positively impact women's growth and education. By partnering with organizations that are dedicated to creating equitable education opportunities for all, We Can Learn works to break the bias and close the achievement gap. Please join me in welcoming Michelle Geddes, We Can Learn Chairwoman and Regional Vice President at Admentum, in conversation with Nadia Siddiqui, Global Connections Developer at Alight. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Michelle Geddes. Uh, I work for Adventum. For those of you that don't know who Adventum is, we uh, lead the way with software to help support students wherever learning occurs. And about four years ago, Edmentum wanted to do more. We wanted to make a larger impact. And so the We Can Learn Foundation came to be. We Can Learn really makes a commitment to helping students in non-traditional learning areas be able to continue their education, whatever that might be. During my time with We Can Learn, I had an opportunity to get together with an organization out of Minnesota, Alight, and I have with me Nadia with the Alight organization. Hi everybody, how are you? <laughs> Happy International Women's Day. I'm excited to be here with all of you. This is my first time in Texas, ever. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Nadia Siddiqui, I work at Alight. Um, we are a global humanitarian organization. We work in 19 different countries. Uh, Poland is uh, now on our list. Um, we are responding to Ukrainians, so. Yes, thank you. Um, so you will find us in refugee camps and settlements. We provide services like water, health care, um, sanitation, shelter, and protection for women and girls. And in my role at Alight, I am a global connections developer, and I work with companies and organizations and individuals who want to plug into the humanitarian work that we do. So that's a little bit about us and myself. So in 2018, I was given the challenge to take We Can Learn and, and build a foundation. I mean, I have never built a foundation. I've never been on a board. Um, but we were going to do it. We were just going to make it happen and make things happen. And initially, we really were focused on some domestic work. How can we help support children outside of traditional schools, whether it be with in-kind donations with the Admentum software or with straight-up donations to organizations that are making an impact? During that time, we've had an opportunity to really break that bias, and we've been able to work with organizations, again, domestically stateside, that are helping to encourage young ladies to get into uh, entrepreneurship as well as STEM programs. There are organizations that we're able to sponsor scholarships for these young ladies, and we have seen them as early as 6th, 7th, and 8th grade be able to come in and do things that honestly, we're probably not even open to me. I mean, I'm 44, right? It, it wasn't that long ago that I too was in sixth grade. And we're able to provide these great opportunities for these young ladies. Well, during our time, I mean, we're both Minnesota organizations. And I was introduced to Alight. And Alight brought us an opportunity. They said, we have one of the oldest refugee communities in the world in Nakiavali, Uganda. They have elementary schools, they have plenty, they can support all the students, but they have one secondary school. And it's on the western side of the camp. So the children on the eastern side of the camp would have to walk three hours one way to get there. We Can Learn is really about creating opportunities within communities. It's not necessarily about pulling people out of their community, it's about making their community stronger. And we talked to a light and we said, how can we help? Nadia, can you tell us what the, the parents in this community were doing and kind of how we started working together? Yeah, definitely. Okay, so I'm going to take you all to Uganda, home to over a million refugees. And we are working in over six settlements there. One of them is Nakivali. It is one of the oldest and largest refugee settlements in the world. It is home to over 130,000 people from 13 neighboring nations. So a lot of people living there. And over the years, because so many people have fled to Uganda and to Nakivali specifically, they've had to expand 
the region and the territory of this refugee settlement. Now, refugee settlements are already like very remote. They are hours away from the closest town. So then what happened in Nakivali is when they had to create a new section, um, it was completely remote and desolate and there was no infrastructure. So families were being placed there, but children were not going to secondary education because there was no option for school after primary. And so um, a light follows an approach where we really follow the lead of the community that we serve. So we call it a refugee-led approach where we look to the communities we serve to tell us what should we do? What are the services that we should provide? How can we create impact for you? So from that, we have this community of parents that had said they wanted a secondary school for their children, for all of the children. And so they asked us for a $500 donation. That's all they wanted. They said, just give us $500. We'll take care of the rest. So we gave them $500, and they started building bricks. They just wanted to make a little structure, just a physical place where their children could feel like there was a secondary school for them to go to. So here we are telling Michelle at the We Can Learn Foundation and Adventum about this story, not asking them for anything, just telling them, Let, I wanna tell you about this incredible community of parents who are figuring this out with as little as $500. And very quickly, I'm a salesperson. <laughs> so I call some folks, I get the Admentum community, I get the yes. We Can Learn community, and I'm like, what, what can we do? And we said, let's build them a school. Let's, let's just build them a school. These parents are passionate about it. Let's build them a school. And we did. We built them a school. The community, I mean, it was, I mean, obviously we put people to work. We involved the whole community, but we built them a school. And as time has gone on, more organizations have seen the work that one small little nonprofit, y'all, we are a small nonprofit. If, if you've heard of us, I'm impressed. But mighty, but, small <laughs> but mighty. But <laughs> yes. This, this small nonprofit was able to build a secondary school in order to impact generations of students. And what ended up happening, a byproduct of this, if you're not aware, um, internationally and, and in a lot of communities, young girls have a couple of choices. They continue education or they get married. If you don't have a secondary school, what do you think happens? They're getting married, right? Yep. And if these young ladies can get this education, they'll still get married one day, but they're gonna have more autonomy to who they are because they know who they are. And so once the school was built, we found girls were showing up. And can you tell about the community that's there now going to school? Yeah, so just to give you a little context, on average, only 20% of children living in refugee camps are having any access to secondary education. And now we have this incredible community where 100% of the girls are all going to school. Yes. And here's the interesting thing. So we can learn, you know, start to fund a school and a beautiful school. I will tell you, I would send my girls to this school because it is so beautifully and thoughtfully created and done. And not only do they have a school to go to, but because of We Can Learn, showing up as a leader, all of these other companies and organizations started following this lead of saying like, this is really amazing what is happening in this community. So pretty soon, we had a computer lab and we had a science lab and we have a library. We have all of these things. As of January, we have a girl's dormitory. Yes. So if you don't know, um, um, it's real important to have a place for students to be. Um, if they're having to walk a long distance, it's a huge barrier for girls in general. And so now we have a place for them where they can stay. And we are hoping that next year, fingers crossed, we'll all be able to travel there together. Um, but you know, the impact of the school with girls is just so incredible because it wasn't, it really wasn't the thing that you were thinking about. It was just giving access to this community for education beyond primary levels. And what we have found is that 
all of these girls are going to school. They're not getting married. They are changing their own life, but they're changing their family's life. They're able to help their families start their own business because they have all these skills that they're learning. And now the whole community is changing and shifting and this total bias is being ripped apart by this community that has all of their girls going to school and that's now their job instead of being at home doing you know the all day chores or um, getting married, right? Like their job is to become as educated as they possibly can. So it's, it's an amazing story and it wouldn't be there without We Can Learn. It really wouldn't because you inspired so many companies to join us and now it's this beautiful, thriving community. And now people, when they go to Naki Valley, they feel happy that they're going to be placed in this area. It's no longer this desolate place without infrastructure. So on this International Women's Day, our message to you is, as you're working in your schools, as you're working with those in your community, if you identify organizations that you would consider a non-traditional educational organization that could use some extra supports, think of We Can Learn. We are here to really help continue to help those students inside and outside of the classroom. Many of you know Admentum, you know, you know what we do, but outside of the classroom, we are passionate about continuing students' education and supporting them anywhere we can. So keep breaking that bias. Think about the young ladies in your community. Think about the young ladies around the world and all the work we continue doing together. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, everyone. Please help me welcoming our next and final session for this evening's program. We're excited to have the Rosa Rebellion team join us for a preview of their podcast's second season. Rosa Rebellion is a platform for creative activism by and for women of color. And tonight, we're joined by their co-founders, Virginia Cumberbatch and Megan Harding, as well as their co-host of Gen Activist, Dr. Sylvia Rousseau, Professor Emeritus at the University of Southern California, who was one of the first black women to graduate from Wake Forest and the first black and female principal of Santa Monica High School in Santa Monica, California. For this special podcast preview, they will be uh, joined in conversation with Austinite and renowned artist Deborah Roberts. Please join me in giving them a very warm welcome. Awesome. Good evening, everyone. Awesome. Y'all are energized. Y'all know how this works. Thank you. Well, um, as Julia said, my name is Virginia Cumberbatch, and I serve as one of the co-founders of Rose Rebellion, and you'll hear from the other co-founder, Megan Harding, a little bit later tonight. Um, and we are so honored to welcome y'all um, this evening for International Women's Day. And typically what we say um, during a taping of the Gen Activist podcast is welcome to our virtual living room. But we are so excited, this is the first time we've ever been live. And so thank y'all so much for being a part of our first studio audience, you know, this is exciting. Um, and our co-hosts, we, we all hail from different parts of the country. You'll hear from Dr. Sylvia Rousseau, who we affectionately call G-Mom. She came in from LA from y'all. Um, and then we have Megan, who's in Houston and myself who's right here from Austin, Texas. And so what a treat it is to tape a little bit of a preview of season two with all of you today here um, for South by Southwest EDU. And today is a special day because all around the world, we are collectively celebrating the power and contributions of women and girls. But when South by EDU asked Rosa Rebellion to take part in today's recognition, we immediately reflected on all the ways these conversations, these movements are often siloed, silenced, and separate from the nuanced experiences of women of color and brown and black girls. 
We can't have gender equity without racial justice. We can't empower women and girls or all genders without acknowledging and agitating the systems, institutions, and stories that we know have not included all of our histories or all of our voices. So tonight we invite you to join us in dialogue on how the power of story through art and creative works can teach us new ideas, can transform oppressive systems, and tell the truth of our full humanity. And so now I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Sylvie Rousseau, who I have the honor of calling my grandmother, who we affectionately call G-Mom, who you know is an education activist, and who will be in amazing conversation with someone as a fellow Austinite, I am so thrilled and honored to have share a stage with her, <laughs> the Austin-grown, amazing, world-renowned artist, Deborah Roberts, and Rose Rebellion co-founder, Megan Harding. So welcome, y'all, and thank you for having us. <laughs> Well, I'm excited. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, great. <laughs> well, I'm really excited to have this conversation with Deborah Roberts because she is an artist that stirs my heart when I look. Her images and love of women and our fullness inspires me. And I call, I'm an educator, but she's an educator too. So Deborah, I want to ask you, there are three things that I see as I've been reading about your work and your journey. There are two or three themes that just seem to come out. That your work is rooted in history, and, but you don't remain there. And then you evolve as a person and your work evolves, but you're not stopping there. You're looking toward the future. And I think I'm right in that, but you can tell me. But it makes me think of what John Henry Clark, the African-American uh, historian said. He said, history isn't everything, but it's a start. <laughs> and it's the chart that helps us find our place on the map of human geography. And I think all history has been filled with people searching for their place on the map of human geography. Some people trying to tell them where they belong, but then the human spirit that I see in your work, Deborah, says, no thank you, I'll decide for myself where I belong. Hmm. And then the final part of John Henry Clark, Deborah, he says, not only does it help us find our place on the, on the map of human geography, but more than that, it tells us what we must become. So, do I, that kinship between I see uh, John Henry Clark and you, am I accurate or help me okay. understand? <laughs> okay. Yeah, there's some similarities um, to my work. Um, I take a four-pronged approach to my, my collages. Um, I look at American history, black history, pop culture, and, um, and I combine all those things together and create these images of black children mm -hmm. as I feel the world sees them. Mm -hmm. Where they are sometimes seen as adults when they're really children acting as children. Mm -hmm. So uh, I take on a lot of social um, problems and engagements and I talk about that in my, in my work. Mm. You know something that comes across in your work is love. I feel that you love our humanity. Mm. I feel mm -hmm. that you, you want to see us continue and you want to capture us with our goodness and our purpose and our beauty. Um, and our children, you do a lot of work around children and a lot of your work is children having the opportunity to be children and be loved. So Megan, do you have something? Uh, children, <laughs> we, we may be going to talk about children here for a minute because you make such a focus on young women having a chance to be a child. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, you know, part of my practice is, is that, you know, young black girls are sometimes seen less innocent as white girls, and they are just as innocent. Sometimes they have to take on more duties mm -hmm. and family responsibilities mm -hmm. that tend to make them seem mm -hmm. older, but they're still children. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I do in my practice is that I... I allow children to take on that, that 
that power, mm -hmm. but also reflect that vulnerability. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, when you have people looking at the work, not only are the kids staring you directly in the face, they're asking you to see their humanity. Uh -huh. the, that's the main thing. Once uh -huh. you see my humanity, yes. then you can't destroy me because mm -hmm. now we are the same. Mm -hmm. And so those are the questions and, and comments that I try to um, build in my work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, G Mom, I think, you know, having two kids now just you know, had a baby girl in November. And so she's, she's really little, but you know, I, I see it a little bit differently now, right? Like the, the urgency um, for our children to be viewed as children, just have the right to make mistakes, to play, um, to do all the same things that every other child does, um, has always been important to me, but now it's personal, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's real, it's, you know, I think about um, the education system, I'm a huge, huge advocate of public education, I'm a product of public education, um, but when I think about the system, there's a fear there, right? Like we, wa we watch everything that's happening in Texas right now where we are literally um, watching history be erased at the feet of white comfort and we just need to call it what it is. And, and I think about sending my black children into that system and a system that devalues them. And again, love teachers. This is not teachers. I'm talking about the, the powers that be in a state like Texas that are making decisions. Um, and so it's scary. You know, it's scary to think about, you know, um, Eli, who's two in three years going into that system. Um, you know, will they see him as fully human if as, as, you know, gregarious as he is and as playful as he is? You know, will they... Um, you know, view that as, you know, a negative when at home I'm fighting to preserve it, right? Like that's his superpower. Yeah. It tires me out, but it's great, you know? So um, it's, it's tough uh, to, to fight that battle and to try to figure out, um, you know, how do I fight to preserve their innocence and their humanity when the world has already decided, yeah. Yeah. you know, that some of the things that they do will be viewed as negative and how do I prepare them for that without also stripping them of their ability to be kids? I don't know, you raised five kids, you tell me. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I look the way they do. I do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Right? She's <laughs> thank you so much. I, I want to say something about school because Deborah, I really think you are an educator. The images that you project enables to see something about our humanity. And that absolutely is what education should be about. Helping people to find their humanity and to be comfortable in it and to know that they contribute. So I'm, I'm thinking about this place called school mm -hmm. uh, and the withdrawal. You know, our children's humanity is tied up in their histories, in their cultures, in their language, in their bodies. It's all tied up in that. And yet those things are rejected in the school. And so I often, when I was a principal, I used to say, and some of you have heard me say this, there was a play on Broadway called No Place to Be Somebody. Mm -hmm. And I think I vowed as a principal, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna make this some place to be somebody for every child. Mm -hmm. And that's our hope. That's what they should discover in themselves. And so, Deborah, art is such an important part of that. You think about, some of you may have children at home. Remember those little pictures they bring and you put on the refrigerator? They're expressing identity, and yet we don't see it. We don't interpret it as such. And so I help us think, I, I wanna see this fusion somehow, that children shouldn't have to go outside of school only to find out who they are. And so how do we begin to create this fusion between a place called school and places that you're creating where young people get to find themselves? So can we talk about that a little bit? Um, and particularly, so our schools, and I'm an educator and I don't mind criticizing myself. She supposedly retired. <laughs> <laughs> Allegedly. Uh, but I think the arts humanize us. 
I, I'm an advocate of science and math and, and technology, but they will go rampant if we do not have the arts, the poetry, the visual arts, the, and so mm -hmm. we would destroy ourselves as human beings. So I'm on this mission for schools being some place to be somebody and a place where people can discover who they are. Deborah, can we talk about that for a minute? Yeah, well, let me tell you, I'm not an educator. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> no, I'll tell you what my work does. My work is an access point for a conversation. Uh -huh. And what uh -huh. I do is I add all those combinations together and give you an opportunity without yelling at you to uh -huh. come explore my work. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And I think that is the reason why my work has caught on uh -huh. the way it has. Uh -huh. um, you know, mark making has been, been here from the beginning of time when people started making carvings and caves and things like that. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there's ways of using art to gain agency in the world, we know that. Mm -hmm. um, we've known that, you know, stereotypical images have used, mm -hmm. been used to disenfranchise people. Mm -hmm. So art has always been very important. And I think in schools, you know, it's unfortunate because I was very lucky to have great teachers in art, mm -hmm. in art when I was in grade school. Um, but we need art because it is a great way of expressing yourself, mm -hmm. one's expression. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but you know, I went to Syracuse University and I didn't, you know, I had to teach, uh, I think I had to teach one year, my, my, my second year, and I was ready to be done, you know, so I didn't say that I'm an educator. But one of the things that I do know is that I do push for education and I want people to, like you said, see the humanity in these children and not change who they are. If they're expressing themselves through play and energy and loudness, doesn't mean that there's an issue at, in hand. It's just a child being a child, you know? Well, Deborah, you said, you know, rejected a little bit the idea of you being an educator, but I think, you know, what GMOM has been cultivating is this conversation around how art, how as a form of storytelling, right, mm -hmm. can inform who we are. And I think about growing up in Austin, Texas as a young black woman in a predominantly white city, in predominantly white neighborhoods and schools, and this idea of not seeing myself in these spaces that I was supposed to occupy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we use this phrase at Rosa Rebellion called creative activism, which is this idea that we can disrupt systems that weren't built mm -hmm. for us, mm -hmm. disrupt spaces, agitate spaces that never had intention to build around my identity, my language, my history. And the first time I encountered your work actually was um, when I was in middle school. And mm -hmm. I was so struck by this idea of your, your ability to capture the full sensibility of a young black girl, a brown black girl mm -hmm. who I identified with. And so mm -hmm. I wonder, you know, when you think about your work and how the people in this room as educators or who are proxy to, you know, education, how um, your work is this form of creative activism. It's storytelling, but it's also disrupting these narratives mm -hmm. that have been thrust upon us and didn't give us the agency to tell the world who we are. Right, that's one of the things that's so important. I was really surprised by the attention my work has been getting because of those things. I went to London and I thought I was going there anonymously and, and to a fair and, and then I was overrun by people is because the work is getting, that message is getting across, mm -hmm. and that's what I want mm -hmm. to, to, just to see mm -hmm. children as children, let them be children, let them be themselves. Mm -hmm. And you know, my experience in Austin is very different from yours because I grew up on the east side of Austin where everyone in the neighborhood looked like me. We all went to different churches, mm -hmm. but we came home on Sunday, we played in the, we played in the street, and, and you know, until I was bust in the sixth grade, I didn't know that there was any difference. I didn't know I was black in that sense until then. Yeah. So one of the things that I try to do in my work is is to be to show the fullness of being black. And black is not one thing. It's not this monolithic idea. Mm -hmm. uh, whatever your experience is, is your experience. That's the black experience. Mine is the black experience. It doesn't have to be the same. Absolutely. And so that's what I'm trying to do in my practice. So, yeah. Yeah. I think about how um, important it is, um, you know, representing the fullness of blackness, right? Growing up, little girl in Tyler, Texas, in the country, and thinking about the images that I saw there, and my parents, like, 
um, intentionality around being sure that I saw black images and you know the best way they could do that at that time was through film and being sure that they showed me um, black images through film and the fullness of who we were not just I mean we watched Roots right they wanted me to know my history but they also wanted to show um, you know I watched a lot of Spike Lee um, a lot of things like that to show us and at the time I actually somehow became a lawyer but I actually wanted to be the female Spike Lee because I did not have I wanted to tell stories right and so full circle here I am doing that with Rosa Rebellion but um, you know I think that when we talk about the power of seeing yourself I remember distinctly you know a trip we took to DC and I am seeing, you know, um, images of Thurgood Marshall and seeing things that I wouldn't see as a little, you know, country girl growing up in Tyler, Texas and understanding um, how that transformed me, how that opened up the world for me. Um, and I think that it's important that it's not just our people, parents of color that are doing that, but it's important for white parents mm -hmm to show their children our full humanity and to do the same things that my parents were doing to open up the world for their children um, in a way that um, may not be innate. It might feel uncomfortable. You might not know what you're doing. You might get some things wrong, but do it anyway. Because I firmly believe that you know, if we want to envision a world, if we want to imagine a world, if we want to create a world, where we no longer have to fight these same battles, where our humanity can be validated from jump, mm -hmm. then it's going to take the um, unlearning and relearning from white parents to teach their children so as they grow up, mm -hmm. um, they already you know, see us as fully human and already have exposure to it. Mm -hmm. And I know that some of our people across the country are fighting like hell right now to not do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So many things come to mind, so I'm all, I'll try to pull them out right quickly. <laughs> so one of them, uh, uh, Deborah, I really mean you I think we have narrowed the term educator so that it eliminates so much of the richness that uh, children need in various ways. Uh, so you are an educator. I, I'm dubbing you today. You are an educator. <laughs> So I think that's important. Um, and also, I think um, a friend of mine said, everybody has a story to tell. And they're not fully embraced until they get a chance to tell that story. So, but I think that there's so much richness in communities that I'm an advocate. I don't know if any of you know of the movement across the country around community schools. But the concept is that schools cannot be this isolated outpost stuck in a community. And that, uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, because I think that's an error. There's so much in our communities that teach. And, and we've isolated, and there's this hierarchy we have that bring us your children, we'll fix them, don't bother us, come home. But there's a richness in these communities such as people like you creating, that we really want schools, schools cannot isolate themselves and just say, I'm the only entity, I'm the authority. But I'm very drawn to the work of Bron von Brenner when he says, the micro system in which children develop and find their identity and grow and are nurtured and help well-being, schools cannot do that alone but they can do it in collaboration with the community. And what, all right, I like, I it's need call a and response. This is right at home, and right? And what it's strikes me about Bronfenbrenner, why I say you are, Bronfenbrenner says school is just one entity in that community. But there are artists, there are libraries, there are churches, there are all these other things influencing children but much of the struggle for identity is school is negating those things that are in the community. Mm -hmm. And so Bronfenbrenner says, children grow up strong, they're nurtured, they feel like somebody when all these entities are working together on behalf of the child. So somehow I wanna see 
that come about. So there, there's so many things. Children are learning. They're learning in libraries outside. They're learning in playgrounds outside. All the learning cannot occur in the school, but as we embrace the whole child, we find that they, in fact, we're trying to do work where learning takes place in different spaces besides just the classroom or the school. So this whole humanity, uh, I, I think that's my drive, that every child has a right to a public education, they may not want public, but they have a right to it, in which, and funded by public funds, <laughs> in which they are, uh, their culture, their history, their language is honored in a way that their full humanity can be realized. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I invite many of you to learn more about community schools. They are such a wonderful way of embracing children's humanity. So, <laughs> and Deborah, you know, as you talked about your own maturation here in Austin, in East Austin, and being surrounded by communities and people that look like you and who invested in you, mm -hmm. um, and can you talk to us a little bit about how that has set intention or perhaps inspired your work and how you can see that correlation now you are creating the content and the stories that now young girls right, can see themselves and feel affirmed. Um, and so you think about the, the legacy that you are already leading. Um, I'm sure many of y'all saw her work on um, many covers, but most <laughs> recently, um, the, the, um, an amazing image uh, honoring 10 years after Trayvon Martin. And I think connected to what Megan was saying is this idea of telling our stories as truth, right? We are combating the cultural erasure happening mm -hmm. in schools. We are literally rewriting history. Mm -hmm. And what that does to undermine students, particularly students of colors, identity, the footsteps before mm -hmm. them. And so part of that is telling the full spectrum of our humanity, which is joy, which mm -hmm. is resilience, mm -hmm. which is um, cultivating culture and language. It's not just right. trauma, right? Mm -hmm. um, although America would want you to believe that during Black History Month, that it's all just trauma. And so, Deborah, I would love for you to kind of share with us how your own um, childhood here in Austin kind of informed and inspired your ability now to perhaps allow children to see themselves in a new light? Well, I mean, I'm one of eight kids, so I mean, mm -hmm. I don't think, me being an artist, I told my family I wanted to be an artist, everybody laughed. And it was, you know, it was funny to them, but I knew that's what I wanted to do. So, you know, I grew up in the Austin school system, and, it, and this was great. Um, I had wonderful teachers when I went to Johnson High School and then, um, so, I mean, I wouldn't say what inspires my practice is literature. I didn't know the literature was the key that was missing from my work. Mm -hmm. So I, I did a whole thing having different shows all over the, the country. I went back as an older person to Syracuse to get my MFA and with millennials. And, um, I mean, dang, so, Deborah, we got two up here. I'm you a zennial. Shots fired. I'm yeah, a zennial. Um, well, you know, you know, I was bullied because I was on I was on Facebook and I was bullied. No one's on Facebook because I because I had yeah. AOL and not Gmail. So. Um, <laughs> But, I, I can't um, there. You, know, you know, one thing I can say about the millennials is they got me hooked on Instagram, and everybody tells me that my Instagram uh, feed is really powerful because... It is. If you're not following, do it now. Is, is I, one of the things, I talk about all these things, and a lot of the things that we talked about, especially about um, Women's Day and, and Death of Trayvon Martin, when, when New York Magazine came to me and asked me to do the cover... Um, they wanted to do a montage of all the people who have died in the last 10 years, and it was overwhelming with people, and I mm. could not do it. I just could not cut up faces and merge them together, or leaving a little bit out of this person, Mike Brown, and leaving something with Breonna Taylor. And so I chose to do Trayvon Martin's um, face, and then I put a multitude of a lot of little black kids underneath his chin, and his whole idea was holding it, saying, 
um, you know, no more. And I think that they told me that was one of the the hottest selling covers mm -hmm. that they did. And I was really proud of that. So, yeah, you know, that type of legacy is something that I'm, I'm interested in. And, and also just, you know, laying the, the groundwork. I'm walking in someone else's, you know, mm -hmm. footsteps. Someone that's already paved the way, you know. So I'm just really, hopefully, you know, helping other people to move this in this direction. Mm -hmm. And being earnest in my practice, I think that's very important. Yeah. I mean, if you don't like the work or don't like what I'm saying, move along because there's a thousand of people who do. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and so, and I'm not preaching at anyone, even though I come from a family of preachers. Mm -hmm. I could preach if I wanted to. Um, but it's this idea of telling someone, you're hurting me, and I'm not blaming you, but I need you to see me and to see that pain and recognize it. Oof. And that's what my work is trying to do. And Deborah, I, I just have a question for you. Where do you think we are in this journey we've been taking? And I know your art just goes back to very uh, slavery time. And no, now no. you're. No, no. And okay, so, go ahead. I, I'm sorry, you, the exhibit, <laughs> exhibits, I'm sorry, that yeah. you, you featured. Yeah. But um, yeah, I do need to make that. So you, yeah. you, but you make reference to some of these exhibits. So if we take that part of, of uh, Henry Clark, he says, history's not only finding our place now, but finding out what we must become. How would you say where we are, how do you assess where we are now, where we can go, and just a sense of, history and we've moved forward and where are we now? Right, it's, it's really tough. I'm, I, I don't think I'm the person to answer that question, mm -hmm. but one of the things I will tell you is that when I'm in my studio right now, and we, you talk about slavery, and I said, you know, the first group of work that I did, I listened to Toni Morrison. Mm -hmm. You know, I put on, you know, took me, I was doing these dark paintings. Mm -hmm. She took me to a place, Love you, Tony, but I was happy to leave. And then, <laughs> um, you know, get, prepare for my London show, I decided to listen to the 1619 Project mm -hmm. book, audio book. And it yeah. was, it's yeah. tough. I mean, yeah. I can't yeah. even yeah. do it. Yeah. But I was, I was, I don't know, I was surprised by the work that's coming from that. Uh -huh. So that's history within the work. Uh -huh. um, you know, I, I have a love-hate relationship with Picasso. Uh -huh. You know, I love his work, I hate him. You know? <laughs> so so, so I'm, I'm just starting to get the work into these dialogues when you talk about, he, he talked about the, the Negro uh -huh. experience in his work. Uh -huh. I mean, it was, you know, he was appropriating yes. a lot to work. Yeah. So, so how do that? How do you? How can you bring that type of dialogue, mm -hmm. that part of history, mm -hmm. into the forefront? Mm -hmm. And so, um, listening, I had to turn off Nicole Hannah Jones. Love you, sister, but I can't hear it. <laughs> and um, this is too painful. But, but I, I, we can't. I came up with a work. Yeah. And it's, it was coming together today, and I said, that's what history teaches us, mm -hmm. how I can use this, this knowledge that I have mm -hmm. in history yeah. and bring it forward. Yeah. So it's in the mm -hmm. present. Yeah. So I think, for me, that, like I said, creating access points so people can grab yeah. hold of stuff, yeah. that's very yes. important yes. In, yes. for me yes. in my practice. Yeah. 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 Well, I think usually, you know, at the end of our podcast, we give G-Mom the last word because mm -hmm. she's got all the words of wisdom. And so I think it's only appropriate no. we do that this evening. But I, I just want to remind you, and I think, Deborah, you ended us so beautifully, this idea of where do we go from here yeah. and what access points are you granting in your role oh, in this yes. education right. landscape? Yes. Yeah. How are you amplifying mm -hmm. voices that we don't typically hear for? How are you reconciling the histories that are literally being stripped out of our textbooks? Mm -hmm. And what role do we all have to not just amplify the voices of women and women of color and young girls and marginalized communities when we put it on the calendar, but every single day. And so with that, I'm gonna let G-Mom give us the final oh, word no. and we thank you all so much for having us. I just wanna say what I appreciate and you've helped me to even realize more, that there are complexities around who we are. Exactly. And we often can't articulate them Mm -hmm. uh, we often don't know what to do with them. 
-hmm. I, I'm writing my mother's story right now, and I, part of it breaks my heart. She was born in 1914. But what artists do, and visual artists, they take these complexities, which mean your mind is going, you are coming, you're processing it, and you give us something concrete that invites us to join you in making meaning of this complexity that we're living in. And I, I want to thank you, but I want all of our children. I want black women and white women. Rogers wrote The Miseducation of the Negro. We're miseducating white children when they don't have exposure to that. So spread that word. Go wherever they, I know you get tired, but <laughs> <laughs> wherever they invite you, just enter in and open up that conversation that helps us understand the complexity of what it means to be a woman, and even more specifically, what it means to be a black woman, and what's the journey that we have. How do we, how do we create a journey that they can start as children and have joy right. and love themselves right. and make the journey in ways that they see themselves as positive and whole. So, I thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all so much for having us and happy Thanks International Women's Day. Thank you. Thank you so much. This brings our speaking program to a close for this evening. Um, thank you. But we hope that you keep the conversations going uh, and reflect on the ideas and actions that have been presented tonight as we continue our celebration. A huge heartfelt thanks to all our speakers for sharing their incredibly important work and initiatives that they're doing to uplift voices and communities for a more equitable future. 